السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آله سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حمد مجيد الحمد لله رمضان مبارك عليكم جميعا When I was watching some of the footage there, for some people, when they watch these things, especially people in the United States, uh, some of the young people here, uh, they're very alien, distant images, but Imam Majid, uh, myself, Imam Zaid, people that have actually lived in these areas, these are not foreign pictures, they're memories actually like I was actually remembering places I'd lived in places places I'd been Mali is particularly uh, interesting for me because and I was telling him imagine I don't really like to uh, I, I had a very interesting youth after I became Muslim because one of the interesting things about converting to a religion with a lot of fervor is it it's it's almost like a temporary insanity that you go through because you are just so filled with this incredible inshirah this expansion that occurs and i i when i was in high school i was i was kind of a daredevil i used to do things that i think now i would consider completely insane but uh when i became muslim one of the benefits of having a personality like that is that I would do things that I think more rational people would uh, be hesitant to do and one of them was going to West Africa and with really little or no means and pretty much joining a Bedouin tribe out there and uh, drinking water that they drank without ever thinking about any bacteria. I used to just say Bismillah and I was convinced that that was enough um, which is why you need that hadith with also you know tie your camel and trust in God so taking pills preventative pills is sometimes a very useful thing to do but I didn't think like that at that time so when I was in Mali I got amoebic dysentery and I was with a man who lives in San Francisco he was an eyewitness to this named Hassan Barrett I, it, had it not been for him really he, he, I was very fortunate that he was with me because I was in a place there weren't any uh, hospitals there's no 9-11 you can't call and an ambulance shows up and takes you and I was literally defecating blood and going into what I would now understand as a dehydrated state I couldn't even get up I mean he had to clean me he had he took care of me during that time that I was sick but I was very fortunate in that some French tourists happened to come in to town and he was telling them about what was going on with his traveling companion and they gave him flagell which is an antibiotic and it's specific to amoebic dysentery and literally that I believe saved my life at the time by Allah uh, but it was it was serendipitous it was very fortunate that they were there just some pills it's a very strange thing when you're sick and literally some pills can you can be given pills and suddenly you're starting to feel better uh, after a little time and you regain uh, your health so these things when you watch these things uh, they're very real uh, there was a man who wrote a book called Guns, Germs, and something or other. Steel. Guns, Germs, and Steel. I think Jared Diamond's his name. Anyway, he, they did a documentary on that, and he's a scientist that studied disease. And when he was in Africa, he was in, at one, uh, in West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and he was in a, a malaria clinic. And if anybody saw that documentary, it's the most powerful moment, I think, in that entire documentary where he literally breaks down and starts crying. I mean, here's a PhD, American scientist, 
wrote a very callous book about uh, the influence of guns, germs, and steel on civilizations and, and their rises and falls. And there he was confronted with the reality of a disease right in front of him and seeing little children that were dying from this disease and he broke down. He, it, it had a, a serious impact on him. But I want also to remind you of a few things. As somebody who lived in, in this area, and Imam Magic can say the same thing. You can talk about all the tragedies in, in, uh, in West Africa and in... And you can talk about poverty like they said Mal that Mali was one of the poorest countries in the world. I spent enough time in Mali to know that Mali, in my estimation, is one of the richest countries in the world. The Malian people are an amazing people. They have beautiful social networks. They have a religious community. They ha they're wonderful, generous people. The Bambara people, the Puele people. You go and sit with these people. And they don't need Prozac. We've got dogs on Prozac in America. And you know things are bad when the dog is depressed about the house he's living in. No, seriously, we have dogs on Prozac. There's probably some veterinarians here that have depressed dogs. We have cats in America are depressed. So when you talk about impoverished countries and wealthy countries, that depends on what standard you're using to determine what is poverty and what is wealth. If you're talking about material wealth, Mali is definitely one of the poorest countries outwardly, but it's also one of the richest countries in the world in terms of natural resources. Uranium deposits in Niger and Mali. A lot of this stuff, we don't even know what's going on there because Nefarious things happen behind the scenes. Much of the problem in these countries doesn't have to do with poverty. It doesn't have to do with inability or lack of human resources or all of the other things that are used in criteria. It gets reduced to one simple major problem. Corruption. Morality. Basic human ethics and this is a crisis that there's only two things that address this crisis there's only two things one is fitra fitra people that have an access to their original nature and this is why you'll meet people who are not necessarily religious but they're morally upright people because they're connected to their fitra but the other thing that addresses this problem is religion itself. The beauty of Islam is the religion of fitrah. That it addresses human nature. It recognizes our weaknesses and addresses how to deal with those weaknesses in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu if you look now, one of the most interesting things that's happening right now in our lifetime is this system of greed is collapsing. People are seeing where greed takes people, where the breakdown of community takes people. I want to use one example, and after this man, I don't believe anybody can ever take applause or awards seriously. And I, I, I love one of the aspects of Islam is that it's a religion that warns you about applause and awards. I love that aspect of Islam. Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff in the, in the hood, they call him Bernie Madoff. That's what Preacher Moss just told me. Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. Between 1950 and 1972, the United States spent $1.4 billion on the eradication of malaria. $1.4 billion. That's about two weeks of Bernie Madoff's bookkeeping. 
Bernie Madoff was stealing all of this money from mostly Jewish investors that trusted him. Got a trustworthy name, head of Yeshiva's business school, a Jewish university, a wall filled with plaques attesting to his humanitarian impulses because of the million dollars he gave in donations. But he was robbing these people blind. That's what he was doing. He was robbing these people blind. When you look, Bernie Madoff is indicative of a certain state of mind on Wall Street. Make money at any cost. Not a cost to you, at a cost to others. Many of the people that have looted the United States government were coming out of Ivy League colleges with degrees, attesting to their intellectual abilities, degrees in business, and they obviously had a course in Yale or Harvard on business ethics. But all of that learning did not benefit those people in their human behavior. This is the fundamental problem that unless this is addressed, nothing else will change or work. What motivates you? What makes you tick? This is what our Prophet ﷺ called niya. What is your intention? What is your niya? What do you want when you're doing something? What's your intention for fasting? What's your intention for giving money? Once you begin to address the essence of your own being, you can begin to understand who you are, and that's why self-knowledge is foundational in our religion. If you don't know who you are, you're certainly not going to know whose you are. So we all have to ask ourselves, we're living in a, on a planet where the two largest enterprises are armaments and drugs. These are the largest economic enterprises taking the most vital intellects, the most amount of human labor and activity is being funneled in to war and drugs, mostly illegal drugs, to numb people and opiate them from the pain of living on a planet whose two major priorities are building weapons and selling them and making drugs and pushing them. That's what's going on. So if you want to ask who's happy and who's sad, I'll take a Malian happiness. Really, I'll take a Malian happiness any day over the scientists that are working out better ways to kill people that live in beautiful houses with their 401k plans or what's left of them. And I'm not, I'm not just saying this. I'm telling you, I live this. I live with people who smile. It's just a natural thing for them to smile because they're happy people. They just smile. We're living in a country where, despite the fact that it has the best dental health care in the world, people know aren't too generous with their teeth. When I try to talk to people at stores, because in the Shafi'i Medhab, you're supposed to have a human transaction. And when you, isn't, you, transaction shouldn't just be commercial. You should have a human transaction. When I try to talk to people, some people, they don't want to talk to you. They just want to move it along. Reduce everything to a commercial transaction. Life is more than just commercial transactions. Life is about community. It's about humanity. It's about sharing. If you look at a child, those of you who have children, I've only got one who's very small now, five, but I've had five children and I've seen them through these stages. These children will come in. You've got to see this. Come here quick. And I'll jump up, get excited, run out, what, what? And it's some bug that they'd never seen before. Look at that. 
Now, why does he have to share it with me? Why can't he just enjoy the bug? Because life is about sharing. Experiences are enriched by sharing them with others, and that's what the fitra knows. That's what a child knows, and that's what too many people have forgotten as they've gotten older in an increasingly cynical world. And our religion is against cynicism. Because one of our foundational beliefs is that behind this universe is a benevolent Lord. We believe in a benevolent Lord. You want to know about a mosquito? If this world had any significance, and I'm talking not about the alam, because a lot of Muslims don't differentiate between the world as the theater of divine attributes where God reveals himself to his creation. I'm not talking about the alam. I'm talking about dunya, hayat dunya I'm talking about the illusory and ephemeral nature of the world, the belief that we're here for permanent status. The Quran condemns the dunya, but tells us to look at the world, to honor the world, to care for the world, to protect the world, but warns us against dunya, not the alam. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Lo كانت الدنيا تعذر عند الله جناح بعوضة If this world had the weight of a mosquito's wing with God, ما سقى كافرا شربة ماء An atheist would not get a drink of water. An atheist would not get a drink of water if this world was equivalent to the wing of a mosquito. So when we talk about who's suffering and who's not suffering, the Prophet ﷺ said that fever was from a place in hell. Fever, the Prophet ﷺ said, removes wrong actions from the body. And I've been in very intense fever. When I lived in Mauritania, remittent fever, uh, th this is just normal life. Getting a fever every four days, getting a fever every three days, every two days, this is normal life for many, many people. All of those people that I lived with, and I got fevers, I got chills, night chills, And I know that mosquitoes do discriminate. Somebody said they don't discriminate. I know for a fact that they prefer white meat over dark meat. Because I used to wake up with red. They were all over my arm. And the kids used to marvel. Because they didn't show up red on their arms. I looked like I had smallpox. Fever is a part of life. In this hadith, and Imam Majid mentioned earlier about this. In this hadith, مثل المؤمنين في توادهم وتراحمهم وتعاطفهم كمثل الجسد The likeness of the believers in their mutual love of each other, in their mutual desire for mercy, of showing mercy for each other, and in their mutual empathy to عطف is empathy, to be empathic, to feel the pain of another. He said it is like the body. It is like the body. The ummah is like a body. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi It's His language is so beautiful. If one part of the body begins to complain, the rest of the body calls each other. Tada'alahu calls each other to da'alahu calls each other bisahri wal humma with insomnia and with fever the prophet sallallahu was pointing to symptoms but indicating what's really going on to da'alahu they respond with their immune system. The sahar and the fever 
are only attributes, they're, they're, they're symptoms of a body responding to some harm. This is what our ummah is like. Al-mu'minu lil-mu'mini kal-bunyan. The believer to other believers is like a building. In another metaphor, he said, we're like a building. We support one another. We have problems all over this world. These problems aren't going to go away overnight. But we're here for a short time to address these problems. But unless we address the fundamental problems, and I'm talking about the human element, in all of these things because if you look at malaria today malaria was a major problem here in Washington area this was a major center of malaria in the 19th century Baltimore Philadelphia New York all had major malarial problems half of Illinois was infected with malarial fever in the 1860s according to their their own studies at that time half of rural Illinois was infected with malaria Malaria was widespread in the United States. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Constitution of the uh, Declaration of Independence, was a physician in Massachusetts. He was one of the most staunch anti-slavery uh, founders of this country and wrote beautiful things. He actually went to one of the African American churches in Boston, supported them in their efforts. He felt that ignoring the problem of racism was one of the biggest mistakes that the founders had done. Benjamin Rush said, just as clearing a land destroys it, like when you go in and cut everything down, you destroy land. Cultivating land, and I mean by that, and he said, draining its swamps, burning its brush, removing its weeds, taking away the unwholesome effects of too much moisture in the land makes it healthy, renders the land healthy. He said malaria will not be eradicated until we cultivate the land, land cultivation. This is why malaria no longer exists in places like Italy where the bonification efforts in the 1920s during the fascist government got rid of malaria. Sardinia, a major center of malaria. England, people don't realize that England was once a major center of malaria. How was it treated? Raising the standards of living, cultivating the land, changing the landscape, changing the ecology so that the malaria bug could no longer flourish in that type of environment. Bringing in livestock because certain malaria bugs will thrive on livestock and they will actually begin to outnumber the ones that thrive on human blood. These were the ways that malaria disappeared from large segments of the earth. But in, in the 20th century, especially after World War II, DDT was discovered by a Swiss pharmaceutical company and hundreds of millions of dollars went in to funding the idea of eradicating the malaria bug with chemicals. Unfortunately, they found out later what DDT was doing to the environment. This is always the problem of looking at the world without holistic eyes, looking at the world without understanding the deep intricacies of the world, that the world is bound up with each other. You can't separate this from that. You have to address problems ecologically. This is exactly, and I'll use a political metaphor here, this is exactly the, the plan of the Bush government in eradicating terrorism. Just like they want to eradicate malaria. Just send bombs, drop bombs on people, eradicate these evil doers, and suddenly it's just all going to go away. Well, life doesn't work like that. Life doesn't work like that. You have to address the causes of malaria. Malaria is directly related to poverty. Malaria is directly, if you look now on the map of countries that are suffering from malaria, these have some of the highest rates of conflict in the world. They're like maps for places where there's large conflicts. Why? Because war and malaria go together. We have a history of war and malaria. And that's why when you sell these countries weapons, when you sell these countries weapons, you are depriving them 
of health care programs. You're depriving them of sanitary water. You're depriving them of education that will elevate their populations. That's what you're depriving them of. And you're giving them malaria. You're giving them yellow fever. You're giving them HIV AIDS. That's what you're doing. There is a direct correlation to commerce and what's happening in the worst parts of the country and in the best parts of the country. There is a direct correlation. You cannot separate economics from morality. Adam Smith, who's called the father of capitalism, and if he was alive today, he would spit on the men that are calling him the father of capitalism because the capitalism that Adam Smith believed in and the capitalism that exists today has nothing to do with each other. Adam Smith, before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, wrote a book on moral sentiments saying that the basis of commerce was morality. That every transaction is a moral transaction because it gives each of the people in the transaction a chance to honor the other and not cheat them. And this leads to a win-win situation which is necessary for civil society. That is a different type of capitalism than the type of capitalism we see when it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, the high price of low cost, when Walmart comes in and destroys whole communities. We have to see the relationships. Our religion is an economic religion. It is the last religion that is addressing the economic problems of humanity. The Jews have abandoned their economic injunctions. The Christians have abandoned their economic injunctions. It's in the Old Testament. They know usury is prohibited in the Old Testament, but nobody talks about it. Mu'at of Imam Malik, two-thirds of that book deal with economic matters. Medina was a place of transactions. Until we begin to address these problems and the fundamental core issues of these problems, we need societies that are committed to law and order, but you can't have societies that are committed to law and order when there are people above the law. If you have people above the law, the people below the law see no reason to obey the law if they can get away with it. When George W. Bush got away with murder, and he did get away with murder, and I encourage all of you to read Vincent Bugliosi's book on the prosecution of George W. Bush for murder. Vincent Bugliosi argues in that book that George W. Bush is guilty of murder in the first degree, because in our legal system, you have a principle called felony murder. Felony murder is a type of murder that, that occurs during the, uh, the commitment of a felony crime. If you fire a gun in the air during a robbery and it ricochets and kills somebody in that room, you are guilty of first degree murder in our legal system. Lying to the American people to send them to war is a felony. Lying to the American people to send them to war is a felony. It's a felony. Vincent Bugliosi, who was the district attorney of Los Angeles, said we cannot have a legal system, a system of law and order when there are people above the law. This is hukm al-jahiliyyah. This is what the prophet came to eradicate, not malaria. He came to eradicate injustice. And when you eradicate injustice, you eradicate things like malaria because they're inextricably bound. That's what we should be working to do. We should be working towards more just societies, more just distribution of wealth. This is what we have to be doing as a community. The Muslims have lost their moral compass. We have the most corrupt countries in the world. We have no moral capital to speak from as an ummah. But we still have individuals, the ulu baqiya, people that abide by the truths of the Quran. And there are many people like that in this country. There are many good Muslims in this country. These are the people that need to rise up. An ummah in this country to become an ummah فَلْتَكُمْ minkum ummah. Let there be amongst you a group. Min tabaid. Most of the ulama say this is a partitive preposition. That this means some of you. There should be amongst you those. يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ They call to good. وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ And they forbid evil. These are the people that we want to be from. That's what I see in this country. A thriving Muslim community that is dealing with root problems, not with mosquito nets. And that's good, and I'm not in any way detracting from that because I used a mosquito net when I was in West Africa. That's fine, but that's still looking at the symptomatic problems. Until the root problems are addressed, 
And that's why we need malariologists, we need scientists, we need social commentators, we need people that are going to write papers on how to deal with these issues. We need our community to rise to the challenge, not to be obsessed with the pursuit of wealth, which is a false pursuit. All of these people who've had the equity of their homes wiped out, all of that pursuit, it's gone. All of the wealth, there are hundreds of thousands that they thought they had in their, in their homes. They'd spent their whole lives paying off their mortgages and they got wiped out in a usurious system that they don't even understand. They don't even understand fractional reserve banking or how printing up false money. I, I was at a store yet, two days ago and I gave him a hundred dollar bill and he was looking like that. I said, man, you're never going to spot the counterfeit on that because the one that counterfeited that is so good at it it looks exactly like a real dollar. He said, he looked at me like I was crazy. I said, the US Treasury counterfeited that, man. That's right. That is wealth that doesn't exist. It's not backed by anything. It's not backed by gold. It's not backed by silver. It's not even backed by, by debt anymore. They're just printing it up, churning it out. Trillions of dollars. Bailing out all of these fat cats I mean, Jesse James and Frank James had nothing on the bank robbers today. They used to go in with their faces covered. These guys are on the board of the banks. Seriously, they don't need to cover their faces. They're on the boards of the banks. They've got the congressmen facilitating the robbery. Like John Dillinger, who used to go in and pretend they were having a movie. And, and the people would watch him rob the bank thinking they were part of a movie scene. That's what we've got today. Americans watching their children's wealth and their children's children's wealth being robbed from them blind, and they think that this is part of the recovery package. People have no idea what's going on there, and Muslims should find out if they don't know and begin to educate our own community. How can we address real problems? Not artificial real problems, the real problems of this world, and I'll finish. Gandhi said there were seven things that were going to destroy us. Wealth without work. People that want to invest in a hedge fund, do nothing but put their money there, no risk. If it fails, they get bailed out by taxpayers. This has to end, and the only way it can end is by a populace that's vigilant a citizenry that actually reads and knows what's going on. And that's why entertainment and dumbing people down and keeping them from thinking about these things, as long as that continues on, as long as people are more concerned about what's going on on the reality television show they're obsessed with, or who won this, that, or the other game, as long as they're entertained by those things, the wolves out there are going to keep eating the sheep. Wealth without work, Pleasure without conscience. We live in a society where sexuality now has become a technique. You buy a book to learn how to become a good lover. There's websites now that, that uh, for cheaters.com where married couples can find other married couples that want to commit adultery. What's happened to our society, people? You, you can't sit around and just think these things are normal. These are terrible signs. Pleasure without conscience, without thinking of the repercussions of what happens when you pursue pleasure without any moral compunction. Knowledge without character, going to Yale, Harvard, getting these degrees, and then robbing people blind and laughing about it. Enron, the smartest men in the room. That's what happened in Enron. They were laughing about the money they were robbing from old people. There's transcripts of their phone calls, laughing about grandmas that were losing their shirts, paying for the high cost of energy in California because they were being completely robbed blind by immoral people. Commerce without morality is an extension of business with, of character, knowledge without character. Commerce without morality. The foundation of Islam is, is character. I was only sent to perfect character. That's the foundation of our religion, inculcating character.
That comes from examples. That comes from living in communities where character is practiced on a daily basis. Generosity, courage, modesty, chastity, love of knowledge. Science without humanity. We've got studies here on dogs. Seriously, on dogs and cats. And I'm all for taking care of dogs and cats. When, when the Muslims had thriving civilizations, they had awqaf for dogs and cats. We know that. They had awqaf. Even, even in, in fast, they had a waqf for stray dogs to feed them. But when you're taking care of dogs and cats, and you've got baby, human babies dying, something is seriously wrong with your priorities. Because in a hospital, you have what's called triaging. Every emergency doctor knows and nurse knows about triaging. If a patient comes in and their limbs off and they're bleeding out, you don't sit next to that patient talking to the guy with the headache and asking him, is it sharp or is it cutting? What type of headache do you have? You take care of the man who's hemorrhaging to death. Triaging, priorities, science. We've got all of our talented scientists developing weapons of mass destruction for enemies that are created out of thin air, enemies that are more like characters out of a James Bond film, living in caves somewhere, boogeymen that are conjured up to scare people. Are you scared yet? That was a headline on Time magazine. We need our scientists to actually be in the pursuit of excellence, not for profit, not for the Nobel Peace Prize. Feasibilillah. Feasibilillah. It's a completely different set. Religion without sacrifice. Imam Zayd was talking about. Can you have submit? Enter into Islam totally and completely. Don't be half-hearted, half-baked. You can have half-submission. It's called nifaq. That's what half-submission is called in our religion. It's called nifaq. They just get up there lazy. They do it half-heartedly. And finally, politics without principle. Politics without principle. Barack Obama is from, from uh, ancestry. His father was from Kenya. Malaria is a major problem in Kenya. It's a personal problem for him. But when you're in a political machine that eats at principle, when you can't speak the truth because you're so afraid of what the spin doctors are going to do, Fox News will turn everything upside down. And so will ABC and CBC and NBC and all of the other ones. They just have different degrees of it. But I'll give you an example of politics without principle. When you don't deal with tort reform in malpractice cases, that's politics without principle. Because the tort lawyers in this country are so powerful, they don't want caps on malpractice suits. Which raises up the cost of everything. It forces doctors to do unnecessary procedures, which elevates the cost of health care. But they don't want to talk about that because it's politics without principle. Instead of looking at the principle, and we have caps in Islam. The Prophet put caps on a human life. No life can be judged by wealth. And that's the point. The higher you go doesn't make it any less or more. But the cap is a cap because people can't afford. If you, if you make things so exorbitant, everything goes up with it. We have caps. Every, a finger has a certain amount. A tooth has a certain amount. A ear has a certain amount. It's already done. Allah did it. The Sharia did it. We don't need tort reform in Islam. But they need it in this country. Politics without principle. Socrates said in the Apology, to the people of Athens. If you stop worrying about the interests of the state and start worrying about the interests of your souls, the state will take care of itself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.